There are several moments throughout our time on this earth that cause us to turn introspective, to start asking some of life's biggest and most difficult to answer questions. Usually in times of transition or wholesale change, we will take a look at our lives and ask questions like, why am I here? What is my purpose on this earth? Have I lived my life the best way that I could? Have I taken advantage of the opportunities that God has given to me? And pretty quickly, interestingly enough, these questions turn from being individual in nature to communal. We ask things like, how will people remember me? Did I make a difference? Did I make the world a better place? And in essence, what we're asking in those moments is, in my time here, did I do enough for other people? Did I do enough for those that occupied space in the world around me? Why these questions? Why do we ask ourselves these big, difficult questions in moments of change? Maybe that's because every day we are tempted to live in the short term. Every day we wake up and we think, what is, think about what is right in front of us. What's next on the agenda? We think minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, and all of a sudden, in these times of big change, we have an opportunity to look past what's right in front of our faces. And then we start to wonder about the big picture. We start to wonder about long term, and we realize that there's a part of us created to be for more than just now. There's a part of us that is created for long term ideas, for long term ideas impact. Just a few weeks ago, our Mayfair church stood on the precipice of one of those big transitional life-altering moments, and as we were reflecting on our last 65-year history, we started to ask some of these questions. We started to ask about our impact in the world, what we had accomplished, had we done enough with what God had blessed us with, and in reality, if we are being a good, healthy, God-centered church, we should be asking these questions all the time. Are we doing enough in the world with what God has given us? So this morning, we're going to discuss some of those questions. And we're going to do that while we talk about trees. Two trees in particular, uh, two trees that we find specific reference to in Scripture. There are trees in our culture that over time have become more than trees to us. They are symbols. They represent ideas and thoughts and dreams and hopes. We have the famous redwood trees in California. Gigantic trees that soar as high as 200 or 300 feet in the air. They are symbols of Americana. They are road trip destinations. They are symbols of poise and strength and timelessness. In Oklahoma, we have the redbud tree, our state tree, a tree that we use to represent us and who we are. Us Oklahomans hold the redbud tree very near and dear to our hearts. It's almost part of our identity. And even closer to home, about 10 miles from this place, lives the survivor tree, an American elm that withstood the blast of the Murrah bombing a symbol of resiliency, a symbol of hope. An inscription nearby uh, on the bench that surrounds that tree reads, the spirit of this city and this nation will not be defeated. Our deeply rooted faith sustains us. And this tree even made its way onto an NBA uniform uh, via the Oklahoma City Thunder. They are trees, yes, but they are saying something to us. They are asking something of us. And the Bible uses several trees to do the same thing. Most famously in the Old Testament, we will read about the cedars of Lebanon and the oaks of Bashan. Symbols of empire and of human strength. The strongest things they could think of. In Zechariah chapter 11, there is a prophecy that speaks about a day when the Lord will come and he will take his people and he will care for them. And the Things that plagued them, the powers of the world that bothered them will be taken care of. Zechariah chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Open your doors, Lebanon, so that fire may devour your cedars. Wail, you juniper, for the cedar has fallen. 
The stately trees are ruined. Whale oaks of Bashan, the dense forest has been cut down. We're talking about trees, yeah, kind of. But really what we're talking about is power and authority. The biggest and strongest things that they could think of were these trees. And the prophecy says that there will be a day when even the biggest and strongest things that we know will fall at the feet of God. In the New Testament, Jesus will talk about fig trees and mustard bushes. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus will teach that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that grows into this ginormous tree and the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Well, if you've ever seen mustard, you know that mustard's not a tree. Mustard is a bush. Most of the time it grows about knee high. Mustard doesn't become a giant stately tree. Jesus is using the tree to teach us something and he's using the tree to ask something of us. This morning, we're going to talk about two trees that, as far as life lessons go, might fall a little bit under our radar. And the first one comes to us in Luke chapter 19, if you'd like to follow along. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, He could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must go to your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I love the story of Zacchaeus. There is a reason why we sing children's Bible songs about Zacchaeus. There is a reason that we probably grew up coloring pictures of Zacchaeus and Jesus and the tree. You have this short man who really wants to see Jesus. A short man who, by the way, is hated by his peers, despised by the people that live and work around him. And if we're being honest, he's probably done a little bit to deserve some of these feelings. Zacchaeus is a tax collector, and the method of tax collectors in this day was sure to collect taxes, but also probably to collect a little bit more to pad their own pockets. So these people looked upon Zacchaeus as one who is cheating them, who is taking their hard-earned money, who is taking more than he should. So you have him climbing this tree, you have, Zac- or, sorry, you have Jesus spotting Zacchaeus in the tree and inviting him down to eat. And here in 2023, we look at this story and go, so what? Jesus ate lunch with a guy. What's the big deal? In this time period, sitting across the table from someone is an incredibly intimate, intimate moment. This is saying that Jesus associates with these people, that Jesus is willing to sit and break bread with these people. And as they look at Jesus sitting across the table from Zacchaeus, they say, not him, not the guy who cheats us out of our money. Does Jesus know who this is? Does Jesus know who he's talking to? And then we have this complete 180 at the end where Zacchaeus stands up as he probably hears the chatter outside the door and he says, I'm changing. I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor and if I have cheated anyone, parentheses, he probably has, I'm going to give back four times what I took. I'm going to make this right. It's an incredible story incredible people in this story and an incredible message. But sometimes, lost in the takeaway here, is our little sycamore fig tree. Jesus is coming through town. The crowds are big. People are stuffed in shoulder to shoulder. They're jostling for position, jostling for a good view. If you've ever tried to get a shady spot at the 4th of July parade in Edmond, I assume it's kind of like that. (laughs) So here they are all bunched together, and here's Zacchaeus, this short guy, 
Who really wants to see Jesus? And let's be honest, none of these people are moving out of the way for Zacchaeus. None of these people are going to clear a spot so that Zacchaeus can see Jesus. You can almost picture him running back and forth, trying to, trying to find a view. And finally, he looks and sees a sycamore tree. The tree provides Zacchaeus the opportunity to see Jesus. And so the first tree asks of us, in the middle of the hustle and the bustle in the world around us, all of the noise, all of the jostling for position, all of the elbows, are we positioning ourselves so that others may have a chance to go above that and get a glimpse of who Jesus is? Are we providing other people with an opportunity to see Jesus? As our church was approaching these big life questions a few months ago, I think this is one that we looked back fondly of. We were able to answer this question with a few big moments from our history. We could talk about our television shows. We had two of them. We had a kid's puppet show called Carpenter's Children that ran on local television stations on Sunday morning for quite a while. We still have the puppets in the church building. We had a second television show called Something Special, which was ran by a couple of our previous ministers. It was more of a talk show, and they would talk about uh, deep topics and biblical themes, and then they would offer for free a book to anyone who was watching who would like to continue to read about the topic they were discussing. We can talk about Mayfair's relationship with the Casa de la Esperanza Children's Home in Mexico. All the trips we took down there, all the funds that we raised and sent, all the games we played and the Bible stories we shared with those children, and all of the hugs that we gave those kids at the orphanage. We could talk about all the missionaries that our church had supported and sent into areas of the world. We could talk about our food pantry, which is still running, ran last week despite the construction. All of the households that walked through the doors of that church building hungry, and left with food. And here at Crossings, there are so many examples as well. I think about the story of Marty preaching a sermon series on the 12 steps. Think about reaching all this group of people with the idea that there is a God who loves them and cares for them, and a church that loves them and cares for them. We could talk about the clinic and the community center, being the hands and feet of Jesus in the world, showing literally the love of God to those around us. We could talk about the expansion into Edmund. We can talk about sending the message of the gospel of Jesus into our prisons and letting those people know that there's a God who loves them and there is a church that loves them. Have we given others the chance to see Jesus? I would say, yes, we have. The second tree. In Genesis chapter 21, Abraham and Abimelech get together for a discussion. Abimelech is a chief of a tribe that lives nearby Abraham, and there's been some back and forth between the two groups. There's been some fighting, there's been a few arguments, mainly centered around a well located in Philistine territory. A well that Abraham says is his family's and his people's, but Abimelech's servants have taken control of it. And so there's some bickering back and forth about who really has access to this well and whose it really is. And at the end of chapter 21, Abraham and Abimelech strike a treaty. Everything's going to be okay. They set down some rules. In the land of the Philistines, a place where the Philistines currently are living, but that God has promised in that grand promise to Abraham that he will give to his people one day. And after they strike this treaty, Abraham plants a tree in Genesis chapter 21, beginning in verse 32. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. And there he called on the name of the Lord, the eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. Now in this part of the world, we are not as familiar with the tamarisk tree. So most of the time, what just happened in Genesis 21 goes right over our heads, but there is something monumental that has just taken place. If we're reading through our Bibles, we tend to gloss over kind of this coded language at the end of 21 and head right into Genesis 22, which, by the way, there are some really big things that happen in Genesis 22 that might tend to steal our attention away from the end of chapter 21 here. But I heard a teaching a couple of years ago on this tamarisk tree 
at the end of Genesis 21, and I can't get it out of my head. And as we started talking about legacy and big questions, I couldn't stop thinking about this moment. You see, Abraham planted a tree, but Abraham didn't just plant any tree. We're told that Abraham plants a tamarisk tree. Now, if you come across a tamarisk tree in the desert in the Middle East, odds are that it has been planted there. They do grow naturally and can thrive, but odds are, if you see it growing in the desert in the Middle East, somebody put it there on purpose. And that's because tamarisk trees are what we might consider a luxury tree. They take a lot of work early on. They take a lot of pruning. They take a lot of help. Once they're fully grown, they're sturdy and hardy and great. But it takes a lot of work to grow a tamarisk tree. Now, all that work pays off in the long run, especially in a desert climate. The tamarisk tree is known to produce more moisture through its leaves than most of the other trees in the desert. Now, I'm not a botanist or a horticulturalist. I cannot confirm this. But the people that live and work in this area, the Bedouins who shepherd in this part of the world, swear that the shade of the tamarisk tree is cooler than any other shade in the desert. So there is a benefit here to growing a tamarisk tree. It takes a lot of work, especially in the desert, but there's one more thing we need to know about a tamarisk tree. It does not reach its full height. It is not considered full grown, and it does not start giving off this great shade until it is 80 years old. Not 18, 80. Eight zero years old. It takes 80 years for a tamarisk tree to mature. For reference, if you walked out of these doors and you planted a tamarisk tree today, it would be ready to produce that great shade in the year 2103. I see a couple people getting ready to go right now. So if you plant a tamarisk tree, you do not plant it for yourself. You don't plant it for yourself. You don't do all of that hard work at the beginning so that one day you will sit in its shade. And odds are you probably don't even do it for your children. You do it for your grandchildren. You do it for your great-grandchildren. You do it for a generation of people decades down the line that you will never see or experience. And so in this place, in the land of the Philistines, Abraham plants a tamarisk tree, and Abraham says in this moment, we are here for the long run. We are here for a long time. We're here now, but we are going to be here 80 years from now. And not only are we going to be here 80 years from now, we are going to set this place up for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren so that they will have a place in the shade. They will have a place to come when they are here. Now, if you're following along with me and you go, okay, Jared, are we reading into this tamarisk tree thing just a little bit? We seem to be making a lot out of this one small reference to one small tree that we're not even that familiar with. Listen to what Abraham calls God in this place. Verse 33, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the eternal God. In Hebrew, this is El Olam. This is the God of the big picture. This is the God of the grand scheme of things. This is the God of the long term. Abraham, in this moment, plants a tree and says, we are going to be here for a long time. We are going to make sure that future generations have an opportunity to find our God in this place. Not for ourselves, but for our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. And so... Abraham plants a tamarisk tree. And in the Eastern world, the rabbis got a hold of this teaching, and they would teach this text, and they would look at their followers, and they would ask, how many tamarisk trees have you planted? And the question is not about our horticultural practices. The question is not about if we have green thumbs or not. The question is, what are we doing today for future generations that we will never see that they would be able to find God? What are we doing for the future? Think about it. We are living now in the shade of some pretty big tamarisk trees. Our congregation at Mayfair, us here at Crossings, are living right now in the shade of tamarisk trees planted 65 years ago by those who thought about the future and thought about future generations and how they would find and follow Jesus. 
I titled this message A Tale of Two Trees. The first tree, the sycamore fig tree in Luke 19, asks us, what have you done to allow people to see Jesus now? And the second tree, the tamarisk tree, asks us, what will you do to make sure that future generations have the exact same opportunity? A few weeks ago at Mayfair, as we were announcing this partnership, we read from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 43, verse 19. God says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God is doing something here. God did incredible things through people in Mayfair and Belle Isle 65 years ago, and now God is doing something new in these same places. Something you and I never could have dreamed up on our own. Something us at the Mayfair Church of Christ never would have dreamed up on our own. Something that the Crossings Community Church never would have dreamed up on their own. God says, I'm doing something new. Do you see it? And here we are, leaping together into something that, to my knowledge, certainly does not happen very often. Two churches with different historical backgrounds joining hands together over the love for our city and those neighborhoods. We are doing something following God's voice. Two churches working together for the kingdom of God. This is our tamarisk tree. A tree that we are planting in 2023 so that long into the future, the people in Bay Mayfair and Belle Isle neighborhoods will have a church in their neighborhood. A tree that we are planting in 2023 so that long into the future, Mayfair and Belle Isle areas will have the same opportunities to find and follow Jesus. A tree that we are planting in 2023 that I pray that you and I never see the benefits of. I pray that 80 years from now, God is doing something in that area that we never could have thought of and that we never would have imagined and that it would be happening at a scale that we could never comprehend. This is our tamarisk tree. Amen. And here at Crossings, this isn't the only tamarisk tree we're planting right now. We're planting a tamarisk tree at Just Done Correctional Facility. We're planting a tamarisk tree in each Edmund, East Edmond. And we are asking and we are praying that God does something in those places long after we are gone. We want to talk about voices of hope. We want to talk about voice of hope. These are voices of hope that we pray will echo and reverberate for decades on end long after you and I are here, and long after we have the chance to see it. And so as we leave this place today, as we get ready to wrap up my portion here, as we get ready to walk out those doors here in a little bit, head to our cars, would we consider our two trees, the sycamore and the tamarisk? And would we ask ourselves two really big questions? Are we giving others the chance to see Jesus today? And are we giving others the chance to see Jesus long after we're gone? And as we close, let's also not forget the third tree, a tree planted by Jesus Christ on a hill in Golgotha, a tree that provides shade for all those who would choose to rest in its shadow, a tree whose shade we find eternal peace and rest. At this time, I'm going to invite our prayer teams down to the front, and I'll close us with a prayer from the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. A prayer over the Voice of Hope initiative a prayer over this Oklahoma City location, a prayer over East Edmond, a prayer over Edmond, a prayer over Jess Dunn, a prayer over the clinic and the community center, and a prayer over Crossings Mayfair. Let's pray together from the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.